one more time because we are the body of Christ. And I think we're now joined with the other body of Christ that is out there. Uh, look again, uh, now that uh, our troubleshooters have worked their magic up there. Would you please rise and join me? For indeed, we praise and give thanks to God that we are the body of his son. We are concluding uh, our series on reshaping and shifting ourselves into a new time of ministry and into a new calling and vision for God, for our church and our community of faith here and elsewhere. And we're going to finish that here in Jeremiah 31. We're going to look at verses 31 through 34. And we're going to talk about, excuse me, 35. Uh, no, it is 34, my bad. Misspelling on there, miss thing on mine. Um, we are going to look at that and we are going to, to recognize, I believe, that God is still partnering with us. God still chooses to be with us, to work with us, in us, and through us. In Jeremiah 31, beginning with verse 31, God tells the prophet to say, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. You know, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. May God bless the reading of his word today. Dr. Eric Spivey shares the following story. He said several years ago, Marcia, that's his wife, and I spent a summer learning to can vegetables. We borrowed a pressure cooker from my dad, and we spent days in the gardens picking cucumbers and beans and tomatoes and such. He confesses, I never really got comfortable with the pressure cooker. 
I followed the instructions, but was always wary of this device heating on the stove as I watched the small release valve bouncing up and down as the steam whistled out. And when the timer was done, I breathed again, and we pulled out jars of green beans and made strawberry jam and homemade sweet pickles that would last us for more than that year, other years. I thought about his story about learning how to cook with a pressure cooker because if ever a year was made and pressure cooked, it was 2020. Between personal and professional and societal issues, we have all felt the little release valve bobbing up and down as the steam whistled out and wondered, you know, what do we do now? Under the pressure of the cooker, though, under that lid that is there, a lot happens. The jars of vegetables, cucumbers, jellies are placed in the pressure cooker one way, and then when it is complete, they are removed, and they are different. They have been pressurized and put together in such a way that, that they will stay okay. They won't go bad. They might be, what you would say, transformed. The steady heat allowed the ingredients that went into the cooker to, to be changed so that something new could emerge when the time was over. Well, 2020 has seemed to be slow, steady pressure. For more than these 11 months, in my opinion. seems like it's been 11 years. You know, I'm not... Sure, but if you're like me, I wish the timer would go off. I wish the steam would be let out. I wish for the lid to be opened up. But if you were to do that when canning something when, and do it too soon, do it prematurely, you'd ruin the process. You wouldn't get what you were aiming to get, what you could have gotten. The process fails. Now, as to when the time comes that the pressure may be released for us, for many, God only knows. But what I want us to do, and I think I've been saying this for a few weeks now, is not waste this time, this pressure. God is working on us so that we may become, as Paul likened us in the 2 Corinthians, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold the new has come. We have a choice in how we will understand or tell this gospel story to each other and to our community. We have a choice to allow the pressure of this year and this time to forge even deeper our sacred relationships with God. It is a time for us to see how we can find ourselves shifted, reshaped from all of this. It's a time to partner with God, believe it or not. What will we look like after all of this? Pygmalion was a Greek character from Ovid's ancient narrative poem called Metamorphoses. Pygmalion was a victim of his own talent. He was such a gifted sculptor that the result was he imparted the, the things he admired most about his work and he fell in love with the statue that he created. The story of Pygmalion has found its way into our modern vocabulary, though, something Instead, what researchers call the Pygmalion effect, and what the Pygmalion effect says is when we believe something will happen, or more accurately, that we believe someone is a certain way, then unconsciously, we tend to see them in that light. How they behave fits as much how we believe as it does who they really are. When we believe a person is witty, we find ourselves laughing a little more at their jokes than maybe they deserve. <laughs> When we believe that she is smart, we think her insights are brilliant, when in fact they might be trite. When we believe that they are full of potential, when we present them with opportunities to demonstrate their ability, we believe in them and we think that maybe they succeed more than they do. Now all that said, in psycho terms, there's a negative counter option to this. It's called the Gollum effect. It's 
if you will, Pygmalion's evil twin. The Gollum effect happens when we believe less about a person or a group, thinking that he or she or they are destined to failure. They are not bright. They are stuck in unhelpful patterns. Our negative perception shapes the way we relate then to that person. And the idea of Gollum comes from, of course, Tolkien's story of the Lord of the Rings and the way that the character of Gollum had already been assigned, in a sense, his failures and his darkness by the way people looked at him. One of the problems that we can have is that we lose our hope and some of the common heresies of hope are the phrases that we seem to use. It's too late, we say. Nothing can be done about it. You really can't change the way things are. There's no hope. Would you just get real? Just give it up. I mean, what's the use? Did you hear all those? I've said those. Haven't you? Well, that's the problem. We have allowed our negativity to embrace who we are instead of allowing God's grace to transform who we are into God-like attitude and vision. So how does all this relate to church? Well, if we believe that there is no hope for the future of our church or for this community that somehow we are all destined to failure, then it's going to reflect in our worship or our ministry and our likeness. I mean, we might look around in the quagmire in a pandemic world and just figure it's never going to get better, and so we paint both the mission of our Lord and our own ministry in these kind of negative, defeatist tones. And it shows people see when the church begins to lose its hope. However, if we're a little more like the Pygmalion effect, we strengthen what is best, that we see our mission and our ministry and and then add what we have learned to that. I've been saying for this while that the new world that we find ourselves in, the midst of, will all kind of change back at least as close to normal as it may ever get someday. But if we just pick up where we left off, if we are able to flip the switch and suddenly it is more like February 1st, 2020 than it is November 22nd, 2020, what will we have learned? What will we have have experienced and learned and apply? to this new truth that God has revealed to us in a time of change. In a sense, we'd be like we were exiles for nothing. I mean, I admit I am disappointed at the events of this year. Particularly, I go back to March that still impact me to this day. Some nine months later, I was primed for our reshaped team to explore with two other churches uh, a future of a Baptist witness and ministry in this city. I was excited that Mark Tidsworth was coming for homecoming in May to speak to us, to kind of keep things, uh, to, to begin some of our learning processes that direction, only to discover that, well, we move it to September, only to discover it's somewhere out there. I mean, I believe and still do that at that time, all things in the Spirit were ready to move. The enthusiasm was there. The hope was there. All that we were looking for was kind of there. And then, <sighs> shut down. The hiccup starts. Do we? No. Maybe that. No. Look, things are going. Oh, man, the numbers. Now the numbers of cases are worse today than they were in March, April, and May. But what I've come to see is that God didn't stop working, nor did this virus quench the Spirit. God was still partnering with your life and with my life, partnering with our church, maybe even creating new partnerships, You know, a Pygmalion attitude looks at the world differently. It looks for possibilities of how my commitment can change things through Christ. The story goes that the governor of Texas, according to this story then, Mark White, 
he and his wife were driving through the open Texas countryside one day, just trying to get away from all of the hubbub and everything of Austin. And they just started talking and enjoying time together, just the two of them. And needing some fuel, they pulled up to a, one of those rare but great full-service gas stations. And they just wanted to check out the car. You know, so Mark noticed, though, that when they pulled in, his wife seemed a little nervous. He, and he didn't say anything, but he wondered what was going on. And then when the gas attendant came out to their car, Mark said he began to notice something's really odd here. Both his wife and attendant looked surprised to kind of see each other, and they acted with that awkwardness that two people have you know, when they see each other and they maybe were close in the past and they're not anymore and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. They finished at the gas station, continued back down the highway together. The car was silent for a long time. She just kind of drifted her eyes out the door and he just kind of, you know, kept the silence there. And finally he couldn't take it. He said, honey, I couldn't help but notice how you and that gas attendant looked at each other. There's something there between the two of you back when, isn't there? She said, yeah, kind of quietly. He said, well, I, I kind of guessed how you feel, and I figured you need your space to process that, so I didn't say anything till just now. And thank you. He said, I guess you're probably thinking right now as you look out that window about how two different our two lives had become i guess you you were thinking that maybe if you had married him then you'd be the wife of a gas station attendant rather than the wife of the governor of texas right and she said well no actually i was thinking man he'd be the governor by now <laughs> we sometimes have to realize that our attitude of what we change and what we can do through the power of Christ means a lot. Jeremiah writes in our text during a desperate time when it seemed the only partnering being done was really not between God and his children, it was between other nations. Babylon ruled the east and Jerusalem itself was conquered and the leadership of God's people had been taken into a foreign land and there they were left to serve a foreign power. Egypt had experienced a power surge, a rebirth, if you will, of their might in the west at the same time. So really amid all of this turmoil, Jeremiah writes God's word to the exiles and if we're paying attention, we might just see God's word to the pandemic exiles. In this text of Jeremiah 31, the lesson is part of what's called by scholars the book of consolation. It's, it's a part of the, the, the book of Jeremiah embedded inside the whole of Jeremiah. And it's a collection of these prophetic oracles, some of them written in prose, some of them written in poetry. And they emphasize the consolation of Israel and Judah. In other words, helping them through this exile. They follow the social, the political, the military, and the religious tribulations that, that Israel and Judah have endured at the hands of powerful neighbors around them. And he tells them, the days are coming. That's a great phrase of Jeremiah's. He loves to use that all the time. And he says, when we will witness the making of a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now that's a phrase that's kind of unique to Jeremiah. It only occurs five times in his work, and the only other place that you can find it, scripturally speaking, or just post-scripturally speaking, is in the apocryphal book known as Baruch, which was Baruch was um, Jeremiah's secretary. In this context, as much as the rest of the Hebrew Bible, the phrase house of connotes relationship, genetic chosen family relationship it's not talking about uh you know kings and david's line and all this kind of thing it's about tribe it's about family the house of israel and the house of judah and he concludes he can, includes israel even though israel's been gone for a while now the northern kingdom was wiped out you know, well before jerusalem and judah and jeremiah was a prophet to jerusalem and judah but he includes all of them he says the house of israel and the house of judah the israelites and the judites if you will 
There is nothing, no idea in the Hebrew Bible, perhaps even the Christian part for that matter, occupies a more prominent theological position than the idea of this covenant. You know, it's the arrangement between God and his children. The Hebrew word baret does not fully encompass all the range of ideas and meanings and situations, both human and divine. They're contained in that agreement between God and his children. Even in the idea of the agreement itself, it can limit sometimes through the passages. But it, it is there to remind us God is doing something new. God is coming after something new. Look with me again at the text for just a moment. You see, God is telling his people he is shaping a new covenant for a new day, for a transformed people, for a, shall we dare say it, pressurized people. <laughs> The exile will forever change the children of Israel. For most of all their history, they had been the chosen ones. They had been the, if you will, on top. And now they are the defeated people, the imprisoned, the disenfranchised. And this experience coupled with this new covenant that God speaks of will forever change the relationship of God with God's children. Jeremiah said that God told him, for this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So what does all this mean? It means that God was still partnering with his children. God isn't giving up because they're in exile. In fact, if anything, God is, I hate to use a Vegas term, but God is doubling down on the children of Israel. God doubles down on his children because God knows he's got something in mind. God still even renews covenant in our own Babylon of 2020. In a different Martinsville that we once knew, God still renews covenant with us. God still strikes partnerships up and vision with us. So what partnerships can he bring? Well, that's a good question. Could it be that he's partnering us to take a little more attention to the people around us, our neighbors, our fellow believers who are going through so much? You know, one of the great outpourings of things that I've seen in the last few months has been all those people who have been stricken with different things, and you, 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 you find so many people reaching out. It may be a written card through the mail. It may be an email. It might be a text. It might be a phone call. It might be just a simple message I'm praying for you on Facebook. But it is an example that God has given us that we are embracing and lifting up others. Can we partner with God more intimately? Be more close to God on a personal level and then let that spill into our communal level with others? Is God somehow limited to only doing things in the good years? And somehow God is helpless in the pandemic bad years? I think not, Paul would say. <laughs> in the 21st century Chatham Heights, are we ready to engage this world with some new vision and some new outlook and some new sacred partnering? We're not talking about membership, okay? That, that is a word I grew up with, and, and that's... The, it had great connotations once, but that word got so co-opted by many of us because the whole idea of membership was the idea of a definition of rights and privileges. Remember the old commercial, and I can't remember which credit card it was, but remember this credit card, you know, this membership, privileges ha you know, membership has its privileges. Out of his Visa, American Express, whoever it was. And for too long, the body of Christ looks at it that way. Membership has its privileges. In the body of Christ, there is no such thing. Membership has its services. We serve one another. We work together in the family of faith. Sacred partnerships are different than man's partnerships. Partnerships are formed when people join themselves around a mission, commit themselves to seeing that the mission is accomplished. You ever work when you were in school on a group project? Did you ever have that wonderful experience when, say, there were two, three, or four people on the project with you, and there was always one person who didn't do a thing? 
I was reminded of that this past week. Uh, Sarah's best of friends, Allison Love, is in a doctoral program at, at Radford, and she was talking about having that experience with three of them in a group in her doctoral uh, studies, and they've got one who just doesn't do anything. Yeah. And so basically, the t her and the other person in the group went to the professor and said, look, we're not going to take this. We're going to, you know, she's done nothing. So you need to talk to her about doing her end or just grade us by what we're doing, not what she fails to do. And sometimes that's what you've got to do because you realize what you present, if not everybody's involved, isn't as complete as it should be. So maybe can we, as believers, partner with other churches to discover ministries that we knew there was perhaps a need for, but which we never knew we could have an answer to meet that need? Let me go on a limb for you. <laughs> I love going out on limbs. Let me go out on a limb for you on something. An idea that I ask you to pray about because I've been praying about it. I ask you to think about it because I've been thinking about it. For the longest time, I have always felt that our community here, with all of the needs that are important to us, one of those things within the, the realm of, of needs in terms of, of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and, and the church is uh, a, a good pastoral care opportunity. You know, somewhere, someplace that, that believers can point other believers to go and to to basically sit with someone who is trained, someone who is, is good at what they do in helping you sort out the things in your life. Maybe even helping groups to sort out things. Or, or it could be anything from personal interrelationship issues to, to grief, to, um, to change, to all sorts of things. For couples, families, everyone. But let's be honest, who can afford a traditional staff person that does that kind of thing? It's a needed ministry, but you just can't afford to, 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 to carve out a huge part of, of budget to do those things. And how do you find, how do you know the person you get as a trusted record? To, you know, that will do something, do what you're looking for, has that vision as well. well. Let me tell you what I've been praying about. Well, the pandemic came, and it brought staff changes all around. Now, I'm not just talking church. I'm talking about your area of life. You know, a lot of people got let go. Or what was the fancy word that they used? Furloughed. Only sometimes to be recalled and sometimes not, or to be recalled at a lower rate of pay or whatever. Now, our longtime chaplain of our hospital here in Martinsville in this community is no longer allowed to bring her professional care and counseling to patients. The corporate model said that was something they didn't need to spend money on now. So, I'm talking with her for a while, she's interested in wanting to do a similar ministry, but away from a corporate world, a corporate model that looks at how much money you bring in and can it be afforded and all this kind of thing. So, talking right now with people in the BGAV and the CBF and Lilly Foundation, Myself and two other, well, three other pastors are exploring ways that we can find grant monies and a cooperative church effort, perhaps, between our three expressions of the Baptist faith and find ways that we can perhaps find possibilities to bring a vital ministry to our community. So I ask that you think about it. I ask that you pray with me about it. I ask that you stay tuned about what are ways that opportunities afford us that can impact our living and other people's living beyond what you're seeing here or what you see posting in online? You see, God is still calling us to partnership with God, even in the middle of an exile, even in the middle of a pandemic. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And for this is the covenant that I'm going to make the house of Israel after those days to put my law within them. Not written down, but within them. To write it upon their hearts 
And then I will be their God and they shall be my people. And when we are faithful to being God's people, whether in Jerusalem or Babylon, then we shall be partners with God. Join me in prayer. Lord God, we don't know a future. We know only you. And you hold the future within your hands. Work on us, lead us, talk with us, nudge us, push us, empower us. Oh Lord, to, to continue to look for creative and important ways to be the face of Christ, to be the hands and feet of grace. Because just as things have shut down does not mean our needs spiritually have shut down. Challenge us and lead us, O oh Lord, in and by Jesus' name. Amen. God has set before us a new opportunity, a new day, a new possibility, a new covenant. Go now. As children of promise to live in the light of a new day, bring others into the light. Take this light to others, offering them the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you all will please wait for our ushers to come and to... to you know, go by your